when I go to the theater, if I can see the acting, I already don't like it. In other words, if it's the performer and his mind and his speculations and what he fixes and arranges is visible to me, it's bad acting, in my opinion. When I believe that there's a human being in action up there, in that moment, alive, right there and then, I get spellbound. Now, to achieve that is, to me, harder than playing an instrument. It's harder than fiddle, than, uh, it's harder than dancing, it's harder than all the other performing arts, in my opinion. When you really achieve that understanding of human beings, that ability to place yourself into the, into the shoes of another human being and reveal that life on stage, it's to me the ultimate experience. When I first began, Herbert had a studio and he said, why don't you join us? I said, first of all, I was 27 years old. I said, I don't know how to teach. And he said, you know how to act? Share what you have learned. Well, that was to me such a wonderful way of approaching it. What I learned as a teacher is to select for the individual actor each time he works, two or three things he can work on that will take him ahead a little bit. In other words, you can tell an actor everything and they don't know where to begin. They leave in confusion, so I haven't helped them at all. So to really selectively go for what will further their individual problems and solve them for them is what's taken me a lifetime to learn. Set up, please. Two for the seesaw. First of all, when you watch your fellow colleagues working, don't be judgmental. Don't say, oh, I like his work, or I like, don't like her work, or you know, to your own. It, it teaches you nothing. If you really watch and identify with it, if something is convincing, Ask yourself why, what are they doing that, that is allowing for that? If you don't believe it, say that's wrong, that's what I do. How can I correct that? And so that even when you listen to me, you listen for your criticism, not just theirs. Then your participation in any, every scene will not be just as an audience, but will be an active learning one for each of us. There isn't a mistake that you make that I haven't made over and over and over again. And it is out of acknowledgement of those errors and trying to correct them that we all learn something and grow together. Look, Jerry, why don't we just sort of uh, get married and get the goddamn thing over with, huh? Big of me? Oh, big of you, I mean. I've got one wife now. Yeah, I mean, after the divorce. Well, I'm not just going to be a ball and chain, you know. Now that you passed your bar exam, you know the first thing I'm going to do? Take up shorthand. Oh, well, shorthand is the one thing this romance is lacking. <laughs> so when you open up your law office, there I am, a goddamn secretary. You're really going to save dough on me. And, and, and once I make enough money out of the law, I'm going I'm to fix up the flat for us real nice. It's real nice. It stinks. What do you want done with this stuff, Jerry? Bills. Gas, phone. Leave them somewhere I can see them. I don't think I've paid those yet. What do you want to pay them for? All they can do is shut you down. If you do, if you don't. Ooh, letters. Jerry, dearest, don't shut me up. Although the plaintiff has conducted herself as a true and faithful wife to the defendant, the said defendant has been guilty of acts of cruelty toward the plaintiff, destroying the peace of mind of the plaintiff and the objects of matrimony. It is hereby ordered, adjudged, and decreed... Decreed by the court that the bonds of matrimony heretofore existing are severed and held for naught, and that the said plaintiff is granted an absolute divorce from the defendant. Why 
What did you tell me, Mary? I had to live with it a little longer. You didn't want me to know? Not till I was on top of it. There was a deep hole. It takes a long time to close over. Then what will you do? Then? Yeah, then? <coughs> Take things one day at a time. What? Pack these stuff. <coughs> you son of a bitch! Did you, did you, did you tell her about me? That you moved in? Yes. Because I had a hemorrhage? I'm not a son Did you tell her I had a hemorrhage? Yes! And you didn't tell me about this? I'm going to start every uh, uh, criticism with your own evaluation of what you just did. Self-evaluation is as much a learning process of acting as anything else. And there is, no matter how deeply involved we are in the material that we're working on and uh, uh, how much we seem to be in it, every <coughs> actor, and you all know this, has what I call the sixth sense, some little clicker that says, oh, what, that worked well, no, that didn't. Why didn't this work? Oh, they're getting restless. I better hurry up. Oh, they laughed on the wrong line. <laughs> we know these things. So instead of saying, what does somebody else think? What do I think? And it'll take you a while, but it can be developed as a, as a very special needed skill, right? So good, bad, or different doesn't have to be brilliant. Just, how did you feel about what just happened? Adam. Uh, <coughs> getting into it, I felt, and it's just easy to say, I guess, in and out of it, in and out of it different times. There were times where I really felt that um, we were connecting, and other times where I was trying to remember what we had done previous, trying to adapt the old space to the new space. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of that kind of in and out. Came from the space. Oh, well, well, not just from the space. I mean, the, from your bodily relationship to the space, so yeah. you were, okay, fine. Yes. Uh, um, Nikki. Um, I felt pretty good for most of it because it felt really new and not nice. Um, I, I, I felt a lot of trouble at the end um, once I find out. Um, and part of it was like the door meant something to me, and I looked and there was no door. But really, I think I just have a, a difficulty with those moments after. All right. Now, some of this was excellent. Now, the end, it's wonderful that you knew there was something wrong at the end. The, the, the difficulty in it is to know the stages of disillusionment, anger, whatever you want to put on it, and not to judge how much it should move in on you. Work solely for a, whatever you use as a substitution for that psychological sense of betrayal. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, right. And translate that to this circumstance, to this Jerry, to these lines. Don't determine how it will grow, that it's got to grow, or that it's got to go up and down. Leave it alone and really go. And you, if you open yourself up to only that reality, if you whisper it's OK, if you shout, it's OK. Don't determine which it will be. Emotion is its like a fever chart. It takes us. We can't take it. Almost no emotion goes steadily upwards and then explodes. That's only a dr dramatic cliche. It, it goes up and down. It can feel, in the middle of the deepest emotion sometimes, uh, you can be almost in shock so that you feel nothing. If you feel nothing, don't say, oh, that's wrong. I should be feeling something. Feel nothing. It, it let what, what moves in on you take you. And out of the nothingness, will, it might come, why? Don't do it. Do you see? But let it. Don't force it. And I think if you leave that open, and at every performance, you should leave it open. You'll mine gold that way. OK? Um, Another thing you did that, was, that got you in big trouble there was that you kept standing. Mm -hmm. Which, I'm sorry, which part? You told her, but you didn't tell me. 
uh, you kept standing there. And no. so your whole body, you know, with all these different things. I, I, yeah. Don't. Do you mean sit or just do something? <laughs> Either one. Sit on a box, sit on the bed, sit, uh, uh, go for a book. We do the most illogical things, but we don't just stand. Okay, can I ask a question about yeah. that? Um, sometimes I have, I have difficulty knowing, like in, especially in a moment like this where something takes the character completely by surprise. Isn't it possible that sometimes as a character you are uncomfortable, you are sort of lost in space, you are sort of... No, you're not lost in space. You are uncomfortable and you do all sorts. It's like... Somebody, I say, what were you doing there? I was waiting. I said, well, what were you doing while you were waiting? <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing when you're confused? Not I'm doing nothing. I'm right. just acting confused. You see, if I say I'm waiting for a subway or I'm waiting for somebody to meet me in a park, right? Now, nobody stands and waits for a subway, <laughs> right? Now, where's the subway coming from? What do you do while you're standing there? How do you make yourself comfortable in relationship to what you're wearing? Who do you see uh, when you plan what you're going to say to your agent? What do you do uh, uh, when you, you take another look? You wait for the train. You count the cracks. You start re rehearsing your audition. You do, but you don't stand and wait. <laughs> and you don't. Uh, uh, in trauma, in, 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 a, in a big crisis, you may be confused, but what do you do in your state of confusion? That's what you have to find. Okay? That's very important. Uh, you have some zinger lines all the way through the play. Don't avoid a funny line and say, I don't want to show the audience that this is a joke. We spent three quarters of our lives trying to make people laugh. Yeah. Right? See if you can make her laugh. Then you have a justification for a comedic line, right? We do that in life. OK, good. It's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Sit up barefoot in the park, please. In your rehearsals, work on place. I work an hour on place alone in terms of what do I usually do in that room? Where's my favorite place? What's it? If it's a new room to me, I ask my partner, what is in your room? What, what, what do we see outside of these windows? Where's your kitchen? Where's your John? Uh, 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 did your mother make these pillows? I don't know, I'm making this up. But I do all the, inve and not only do I talk about it, but I walk around in it. I touch things. And I sit and see what I would do in this room. And then put the scene on its feet and go moment to moment. Why do you come into the room? What do you see there? Where would you head? Uh, are you invited to sit down? Do you find your own place? Does she take your things? Do I take mine? And in that way, the scene evolves, humanly, logically. Don't you tell me when to cry. I'll cry when I want to cry. And I'm not going to have my cry until you are out of this apartment. Out of this apartment. Well, you certainly don't expect us to live here together, do you? After tonight? Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. I want a divorce. A divorce? What? I'm sorry, Paul, I can't discuss this anymore. Where are you going? To bed. Corey, will you come in here? I want to know why you want a divorce. I just told you why. Because you and I have absolutely nothing in common. What about those six days at the plaza? Six days does not a week make. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I don't know what I mean. I just want a divorce. <laughs> You mean every time we have a little fight, you're going to want a divorce? There aren't going to be any more little fights, Paul. This is it. This is the end. Good night. So then, what you're trying to tell me is that you're... 
months. Can you at least take a nap? You don't have to get snippy. Well, damn it, I'm sorry, but when I plan vacations, I'm happy. When I plan divorces, I'm snippy. <laughs> okay. Now, what can you tell me? <gasps> Kevin. Uh, felt like we were together on this. Uh, felt fairly relaxed. Does anything occur to you that I might criticize? An arm movement. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, uh, Melissa. Um, I find it really difficult to start this scene. So, um, although I'm running my objective and my physical goal through my head and trying to <coughs> internalize it in my body, I always feel a little unsteady okay. starting that all right. Now, one of your biggest problems with the scene is that it has no real physical life anywhere. There is standing, there is preconceived line readings, and emotion. There is no physical presence in this room. Uh, let me show you something. I always say we never stand when we can sit. The standing here was continuously placed. If I get up and I'm going to get you a drink, and I head for the bar, right? And I go here, and I'm, I'm going to get you a drink. Now you say something to me. I can stand here for 10 minutes because when we're through with this, I'm going to go to tomorrow. That's what I mean by destination. We are always between places. If, if you stand over here, it's possible you're confronting him here. Now, your standing is dependent on whether you're going to go to bed, but you know, in, internally, instinctively, you know that that's where you're going to end. Or you're going to change your mind and sit down here and have it out with him here. But you're, you never have destinations. That's when you, now you have to fight for relaxation. And your body is fighting to be relaxed. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you both started, I knew you were both in trouble. Always connect your first beat with an activity, with a physical activity. Take a sock off and then start talking, and you'll be better off. Do you see what I mean? If I'm waiting for an entrance, uh, if, if it's no more than an adjustment of my belt just before I come in, I'm more in action than when I'm standing and trying to sift all the homework, and who am I, and who was my grandmother, and what am I doing here, and what's it. <laughs> and I say the three steps are, what did I just do? What am I doing now? What do I want? And go for it. Those are the three steps that will get you there. Not body exercises, not relaxation exercises, not workouts, uh, not inner work can get you in glue. You don't know which foot to start with, you know? So if the body isn't there, nothing else. We talk, we feel, we think, but it comes out of our body. So all the thinking and talking and feeling, if the body isn't there, it's useless. Do you see? Mm -hmm. I also think in, in the physical life, it's it peculiarly staged, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. You're making determinations on emotional results, on highs and lows in the scene. You haven't really found your reality at this point in this fight, what you would do, what you have to do. Do you see? 
it, I don't care if it seems illogical to you, but don't stick to this layout. Shake it up. Start with the rehearsal of doings and, and uh, activities in this room. OK, that's all. Very good. Uh, work on it some more. Destination is probably the thing that, that I think about the most. I can't tell you how many times people have been like, OK, in this scene, you're going to pace. You're going to be pacing, and you're waiting for the phone call. And I'm like, no, I don't pace. I don't pace because Uda told me not to, not to ever pace, because nobody just walks back and forth without a reason to go one way or the other. The exercises and why I devised them. Years ago, when I worked a lot and played a lot, there were obviously times in between when I had nothing to do. There were many technical problems that nobody seemed able to solve for me, which arose, like suddenly panicking with an awareness of the audience of, uh, what do I do if I have to balance? Suddenly I'm hot and, and, and in a hurry and it's dark. And how do I incorporate all these conditioning forces into my work? So I began working at home by myself. And the first thing I learned was how little we are trained to observe ourselves, our behavior. We can always tell somebody how we feel about something, but what we did when we felt a certain way, we're unable to describe. So I started to watch myself at home in, in a variety of circumstances, and then see if I could bring into being and recreate just two minutes of a simple task while I was at home understanding everything that was the cause of my behavior. The very first exercise, it's called destination. What is my physical destination? When you are spaceless, when you don't know where you are, what surrounds you, where you came from, and where you are heading, your body will tense, you will get very self-conscious, and start to arrange yourselves. If you know where you're going, where you came from, what surrounds you, and how that influences your behavior, you get free. Then all the wonderful work, psychological work you do on character and on, on the uh, movement of the scene can take place. Otherwise, it can't. Now, Judy, how did you feel? was excellent. Um, you know why the belly laugh when you fixed yourself in the mirror? Do you know why it got such a laugh? 
Um, I, yeah, sure. You do? Well, I mean, I guess so. We all, we all recognize ourselves. Right. That's what brings about the most spontaneous laughter, when we suddenly see ourselves doing the same thing, right? Uh, I felt that the music was wonderful, but you didn't go with it as much as you would if it, the awareness that it's on, you know? The moment there is no problem, or I'm just looking, you will find that you go with it. It's a wonderful thing to discover. You did towards the end, but I felt that could have been more influential. Otherwise, why have it on? You know, you used expletives. Now, I wanted to, do, in the future, when you work on, if you plan to work on these exercises at all, wherever you find that you snort, use an expletive, sigh, cuss, or talk, do it. These are not silent exercises. If when you start to see where those things come from and how much we do talk to ourselves alone, you're a mile ahead when you get to monologues. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, by the way, a two to three minute exercise discovered from your life and worked on should be at least an hour or two rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> The second exercise has to do with that strange sensation I used to have when I wanted privacy on stage, that, that all those three air walls, you don't have three here, you only have one, but if there would be stage wings here, that you have three areas of reality in which you're in conjunction with, and out here is that gaping hole, the audience, who are looking at you. And the how to retain privacy there not to play into the audience and not to duck from them, but to incorporate this area so that it belongs to your room. By the way, what I'm looking at has to be out of the possibility of eye contact with anybody in the audience. So wherever I anchor that spot, it has to be, let's say, uh, where that white piece of paper is or on the other side of it near that little bright spot just above Kyle's head over there because every theater shape is different, where the exit signs are, where the balcony, what I'm going to use. I go into the theater way ahead of time when the house is empty, and I mark it first so I'm not hunting for my fourth side while I'm playing. Poppy. Is your daughter Marjorie? <laughs> Poppy, you have been very good They said that I had to spend the night in Salt Lake City, and I said, I'm not spending the night in Salt Lake City, no matter what. And I called customer service from the plane, and they were like, no one's ever called customer service from a <laughs> plane before. They're the first one. And Dad, like, all the passengers were staring at me, because they thought I was insane. She's in the pool. Really? I'm so jealous. We had so much fun. Um, you know what I wanted to tell you? I don't think that I'm going to go to um, real estate school right away. You know, I know that we talked about it, but um, it's just, I'm really concerned that it's going to be uh, hard for me to do both things at the same time. No, not exercise. Act. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I just don't see how I can really give myself the both things fully, you know. So I'm going to, I know, I, mean, I know. Well, I thought I would maybe work in a bookstore or a pet shop or something, you know. Maybe I could walk to work. It wouldn't be draining. Yeah. <clears throat> They're good. They're outside, actually. So you got that, right, Dad? You know what I mean about that? <laughs> that means I'm not going to go right now. I know that you, yeah. I don't know. I just know that that's what I have to do. Yeah. Are you going to go in the pool? Okay. Well, give her my love. And I love you, Pop. That's it. Okay, how did you feel? Oh. It was so anchoring to uh, have that there. It gave me right off the bat something really good. And I really forgot for 
quite a while, not the entire time, that there were people here. Absolutely. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? You see, I always say when that works, it's like somebody took the weights off my shoulder because it makes me free to be there. It was a wonderful exercise. I had one question. Yeah. Did anything bother you? Did anything bother me? Or did it occur to you that strange or anything? Very strange. Hi, Poppy. This is your daughter, Marjorie. Marjorie. Is he deaf? He is a little, he's slipping. Yeah, he's slipping a little bit. It's a concern that I have. Okay, all right, then I accept it. But if it really came from that he didn't grasp that it was you? Right, he, he'll say, what, dear? And I'll say, Marjorie. Yeah. Okay, fine, I accept it. Then I have no criticism at oh. all, see? <laughs> okay. He's had a marvelous freedom without anxiety, see if you can bring that to your scenes. Okay, oh, thank you. good. Set up, uh, Marco. We are, you know, a prism of, of different kinds of, of characters, and we have the capacity within ourselves to understand a whole variety of characters. And you don't try to um, pretend to be someone else, but you find it within yourself and uh, find that different character behavior. And an exercise like the telephone exercise shows you that, that you are three different people depending on who you're talking to. Hello? Okay. Uh, uh, Francesca? Mm. Yes, uh, oh yes, you are Francesca, excuse me, uh, <laughs> sorry, yes, okay, are we, are I supposed to call you? No, okay, there is no problem with me, no, anyway, I had to get up, yes, <laughs> you want me, you gonna tell me, okay. Holes, whole street between was ten third, ten, ten, yeah. Okay, tomorrow at nine. Yes, I won't forget. I wrote down. <laughs> yes. Excuse me, I. Didn't understand you before. You said uh, this your friend is gonna play my part. Okay, no, there's no problem. No, it's fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Signorina uh, Francesca, enjoy. See you. Yeah, this is my No, this is Marco, manager of the telephone. Who do you want to talk to? Ush? You, you want to talk maybe to Urosh, Euros first, or Lia Pogacini? They're living here as well? No, who do you want to talk to? I'm asking you, who do you want to talk to? <laughs> Excuse me. I just wanted to help you. Thank you. Goodbye. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't want to. No, it's not okay. 
you know what I was thinking because this is such a lovely weather outside that uh, I want to sleep a little bit. <laughs> and if we can, so when shall we meet? Uh, I don't know, I have just this appointment at 6 o'clock uh, with Christy, but do you have any rehearsals? So, 12, uh, 1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> huh. So, uh, yes. What? I guess so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. John? Okay, see you. Okay. Now, how did you feel? Okay. <laughs> that was very, very good. Now I have a, a number yeah. of things to With say. With waking up again, I think. The waking up, you jumped, you rushed. Yes. What was funny, you got sleepy after you were awake. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But not when you woke. The three different people were wonderful. The first one, the confusion on, on who wanted who, the... Um, the, the last one, the girl. I mean, already how you arranged your, your whole body changed when you knew you were going to talk to her, you know. Now, again, how is that applicable to the part? Let's say the annoyance, the snottiness he developed in the second one through that person can be applied to character. I say, well, I'm never like that. I'm never, you know, arrogant or uh, put, putting people down. Of course you are, once a day, depending on whom to whom. Now, I can use that as a character element when I am playing a, a rather arrogant, uh, uh, sarcastic, snotty young man or young lady, whatever. Now, this discovery of yourself and all the millions of things you are capable of that goes above and beyond your sense of self, which usually is more cliche than any part you could ever play. You know, I, I say, who do I think I am? I think I'm open, generous, kind, noble, <laughs> giving, uh, so that we have very limited image of ourselves. And the opening up this to the point where when am I silly, when am I stupid, when am I, uh, uh, when am I arrogant, when am I uh, uh, neurotic, when am I everything that I'm called on to play in different parts that aren't right off my center. OK. Now, this was very successful. I have one further criticism. Since the exercises are based on building one on top of the other, I don't expect the other elements to be missing when you come to it. The first exercise, which is destination, you incorporated beautifully. You had unbelievably specific destinations just on this floor. But you always knew you were where you were in relationship to what. The second exercise is a telephone a conversation to one person in which you are to test how your involuntary attention goes on to objects on the fourth side, which is the audience. Did you ever use the fourth side here in this? No. When I was talking uh, in the last, I, uh, like a windows. OK, yeah. all right. And as, uh, just as you did it, I realized you did. But it was at a minimum. Uh, now, of course, when he's on his back, his fourth side is up on the ceiling. You know, it's not going to be, I, and I can't force my attention out there. So I should use that more? Yeah. Oh. It wasn't as though you didn't have privacy or as though you were ducking this area, but you are eliminating it a little bit. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah. All right. Very good, Marco. Thank you. Did you have a question? Shh. Yeah. Yesterday in rehearsal, I was, I was playing with expectations, like when I would say something, what I'm hoping she's going to say. 
And in everyday life, you do have expectations with every moment, but some of them might be huge expectations. Oh, absolutely. Some of the, oh, of course. It's not a matter of degree, but there, we never know exactly what's going to come. We expect something, and sometimes we do get what, exactly what we expected, and then we're already on to the next. If I just say to you, uh, uh, how are you? Wonderful. Uh, I, uh, well, it wasn't quite what I expected, so it stopped me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you see, if I, if I say that to you, what I really want to say to you is, how long did you rehearse on this scene? I, and, it, and it's a jump in, right? Now, if I say, uh, how are you? And the actress is fine. I said, now, how long did you work on this scene? Now, if I say, how are you? And he says, I really have a terrible headache. I say, oh, oh, I'm so mad. Well, yeah, how long did you work on this scene? <laughs> you understand? But the, the uh, if I get what I expect, like I'm fine, then I'm already on to what I want to do, uh, the next thing that I want. But uh, you, you'll get the hang of it. You'll start to explore that in your own lives and see how crucial that is to a true give and take. OK. Just recently, I did. Just a scene um, on my show where I was um, first got the keys to my boyfriend's house, and it was like this big coup that I was able to get the keys from him. And I go to his house, and I don't know if he's home yet, and I have a present for him. So I was like walking in his house. The camera was following me, and I was calling his name. And I remember thinking all about it talk before I did the scene, and about place and about expectation, and really looking. If you're looking for something. Don't just scan. Don't anticipate that. Don't anticipate. It seems like the really big thing. For this exercise, the problem that I give you is that you have lost something. It has to be pretty small so that you can't. I mean, if you lost a, a, a big shoe and your set is such, you haven't got many places to look because you would see it. So it has to be a small object, something that is important to you, uh, that you have misplaced or lost. In the rehearsing of it, you will know you put it where you're going to find it eventually. And then it's the problem of really putting yourself into the moment with total conviction so that you don't anticipate and start to play the manner of looking for something rather than really looking. OK. OK. Glasses, books. No. Fuck! Oh, Jesus, I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! It's not fair. Um, <laughs> if you were just a little fucking more organized, I would like it a lot better. My ticket, my ticket. What the fuck? <sighs> Breathe. Calm down. <laughs> what can you tell me? Oh. Um, well, maybe a more gradual. No, I felt the talking took over at the expense of really looking. 
Now, by the way, a side effect of this exercise is that almost always, if you lose something and get panicky, you will start talking to yourself. So it's a kind of nice uh, first step into learning how that comes about. Do you want to try it again? Yeah. Just try the, the first few beats again. And if you talk, talk, but don't make that predominant. OK. All right? Specifics of what she's setting up now. Uh, that exercise can't work unless you really know everything you're dealing with, each pile, what's in it, what it means to you. So it isn't just, otherwise, if you would just put stuff there, it would become general hunting. Now again, it, I'm not getting a good idea and then seeing how I can improvise it. In the rehearsing, I'm truly discovering it so that I can repeat it as if for the first time. OK. Makeup, books, glasses. Okay, now you see, that was much better. Didn't it feel better? Yes, it did. You see, the, the test is, it was, in the first one also some of the talking came was like, oh my God, it's gone, I'm never going to find it. So, which prevents a real search. Do you right. follow? Yeah. In other words, the possibility, it's got to be here, and the real hunt for it, and the, the talking yourself into the sureness that it must be in that first verse. And then if not, where? Could be there. Oh, no, it's got to be there. In other words, the, the whole thing of expectation in acting, that we expect something. And then we very rarely get exactly what we expect, is put to the ultimate test in this exercise. And you can apply. You saw her do it twice now, all the same activities. When it works, when it's really correct, you and the audience, her heart will start to pound. Is she ever going to find it, do you follow? You'll start to care. If it's mechanical, you'll sit and say, oh, she's looking for something. That's funny, do you know? The, just the second time through was much, much better. OK, very good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, inner objects? An inner object is something we contact visually in our mind's eye that is not present in the room. Memories, remember what you did yesterday when you told me such and such. Um, I, I'll show you one of my favorite demonstrations. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to the store. I have to button my coat, right, uh, before I go out. And I'm standing on stage buttoning feeling more and more self-aware, uh, thinking, what is the matter that I can't concentrate on getting on a coat and buttoning it up? So I suddenly, oh, there aren't any buttons on the air. <laughs> oh, thank you. So now, <laughs> great demonstration. Now, I, I, I'm buttoning it up, and suddenly I say, 
why can't I concentrate? Everybody's looking at me. And I think, well, just button the coat. <laughs> and I'm, oh! Now I say, what, I, what am I getting at the grocery store? I, I need those baby peas. They're always out of those. I need a, uh, some bounty. I bet they only have Scott. And I go with my inner objects, and I button, and I don't even know I did it. Do you follow? By contacting my grocery store, the shelves, what they look like, I am then occupied, and I'm in line with going shopping. signing the papers, shaking hands, goodbye, finished forever, divorced. That's what I mean. Huh. And I guess there isn't anything left to be said, is there? I guess not. Right. Okay. Now, how did you feel today? <laughs> I don't. I don't really know. Um. I um. I think I might have been pushing. A little bit, pushing yeah. for the results that you wanted. Yeah, pushing to have something I didn't, and I don't even know that I knew what that was. But I felt like oh, I have to. Something's not here. I have to find it. So it's very possible that I wasn't connected, but that I was struggling to find that thing. Okay. And uh, Kevin? Um, I found that there were a couple of moments that I was just not there. 
And, it, and it's always the tough moments of the surprise when she says, I want a divorce. It felt, I don't know. You see, it starts it earlier, started. actually. I want you out of here. Yeah. You see, and that, that didn't land at all. Your pants were more important than what that meant. Yes. By the way, that's what I want to talk about. That some of your activities, when the activities stay pieces of business, you're using them wrong. In other words, when, when uh, uh, you see, if, if I'm hanging up pants, I'm hanging them over this thing. Now, when this, that they're right, becomes more important than what I'm hearing here, this is not serving you doesn't mean that I don't do this. But you see, if I'm doing this and she says, say to me, I, I, I want you to be out of here. OK, now wait. I want you out of this apartment. What do you mean, out of here? We certainly don't think that, that we're going to live here together, do you, after tonight? Whatever, but then I go on with this. But I don't <laughs> have to finish my piece of business. Do you follow? Yes, yes. Uh, and the, the same with the tooth. You, you, you thought, well, the, I might do that there. So now it becomes the toothbrushing. You stop hearing. You, and you might head here. And you might start that. Then she's saying something. You might never get to it. Do you follow? But when that becomes, then I have to do that. And how does the cap open? And how would I do this here? When, then you stop hearing and connecting. That's why I always say do all the activities before you ever learn the line. Yeah, I think that's it started from the beginning. It of would, the it would. Process. It's very hard to shake that, and really, uh, rather than arriving at it organically so that it's incorporated into the work, it becomes disassociated. You say, I got to do something there, so it becomes a piece of business. Right. Right? And that, I felt, stopped you a lot. OK, very good. And Good. I don't know if this is the best time. I'm trying to apply um, your technique of transferences. And, uh, and I've, done, I've gotten as far as finding moments that I think are applicable. And now I don't know what to do with them. Like I can say, OK, I can picture the pajamas that I wear when he goes to work. And I know how they feel. And I know how they make me feel. But what do I, I don't know how to make that here. Well, have you got them on? Have you got his robe on? I have his robe belt on. So just knowing that's enough. Absolutely, absolutely. But any transference is, if it makes me feel a certain way, what do I want to do about it? Otherwise, it's just nourishment sometimes. Right, okay. It doesn't have direct application, except that it seems to feed you. OK? OK, I All think right. I get it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. When I first learned about transference and substitutions, I remember being very confused as to whether I was supposed to literally like superimpose someone from my life, like a boyfriend or somebody who I loved, over the face of like my scene partner in order to, you know, have the, the correct like emotional investment in that person. And she was like, no, 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 substitution defines behavior. How substitution in relationship to others can change. Let's suppose uh, my sense of age, how young or how old I am, very often depends on whom I'm with. Right? Now, I'm walking down the hall, and I bump into Alfred Lunt. And he reaches out and asks to shake my hand. Now, I'm heading here, and I see it's Alfred Lunt. You know? and, <laughs> I mean, I'm 18 again. That's the, how I feel. I mean, because the, of the admiration about our relationship at that time. Now, I can substitute, if we're playing together, him for you if I need to. Do you see? Right. And it brings about a totally different. Now, the, the whole point in substitution is that I'm not carrying, as we shake hands, I'm not carrying Alfred Lund around in my head. I'm not playing, you know. Where is he? And that's what he looks like. And the, you know, but I'm I'm transferring that relationship on to you. And when I shake hands with you, I'm doing it to you, right? Not to him anymore. That's where we often screw up in in substitutions. We hang on to the source, and it floats around with us. We're doing homework there, and we don't see who we're doing it with. See, when it's translated into action, 
into behavior with the partner, our relationship immediately becomes something else. Now, if I take my snotty son-in-law, the same circumstances, all right? And you offer me your hand. Okay, here I go. And I go, you see, now. <laughs> but I've done it, I've again done it to him, not to my son-in-law. You see, that's the, the step in rehearsal we often leave out. That we imagine, and then we hang on to the imaginative thing rather than putting it on to the object or the person. Right? Okay, very good. Tell me. I was really, really nervous. <laughs> and I was definitely watching myself through parts of it. There were parts of it that I really felt no. active in it. And I think definitely more the physical because I physically am half to trying to get away from him. Um, I've never encountered a man like this before. I've never encountered a man who challenged me. So I think there's times that I, as Kate, don't know what I'm doing. All right. And? Robert. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to achieve most was what you talk about, this elimination of style. And I wanted to be free of that. I didn't want to have it labeled or have it be some sort of, a, you know, my notion of a historical construct. And that I felt good about. I had a real problem with the physicality. Um, and I, I think, given more time, what I would like to you talk also about setting physicality and yet having it be newly alive. And that's what I still feel we need to achieve. Okay. Any physical confrontation on stage has to be worked out like a ballet so that it can be spontaneous. In other words, just slugging or just if it gets dangerous or out of control, first of all, the audience senses that they immediately lose reality and say, oh, that actor is hurting that actor, not Petruccio is attacking Kate. Do you see? Now, the world does say that uh, Kate does limp. Uh, why did, I mean, she should be up by then. She should be limping. She should be trying to, do you follow? Yeah. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Okay? No, those things you have to. In other words, th this is an aspect what I, of, of the, the whole chapter I have on endowment, endowing something with a reality that it doesn't have through uh, uh, physical actions. And in other words, if I have to, if I have to, 
uh, have boiling hot coffee and burn, burn myself. I want nice, cool tea or whatever it is on stage. And then I <laughs> endow it with what it should be, right? The, uh, the same in the fight. I don't want anything that's going to take control of me or take the scene where it shouldn't go. So, uh, but I want to work on it so that it has sensory reality to me and then bring it about so that I can believe it and then the audience will believe it. The point where it does say she strikes him, which is when he says, I am a gentleman and I say that, I'll try. What we had worked out, which is the one thing that I think we really had set, was that I go to slap him and he stops me. That works? Well, he says, if you, if you, if you strike me, I'll, cu if you, I'll cuff you again. I think you have to hit him there okay. for the next line to make sense. Okay. Right? I have no problem with that. Okay. <laughs> no, but don't hurt him. You've got to believe you slap him, but work on it so that you aren't hurting him. Right? Now, um, verbal action. Let me give you an example. If my objective is to make you laugh or to provoke you with a laugh, if I tickle you first and you laugh, I have no need for the words anymore. Um, it's the same with the physicality. The words are already duels. Uh, best beware my sting and a wasp and uh, with my tongue in your tail. The scene works much better if you cut the physical attacks to where they are called for in the script and nowhere else that you will see that it's much easier. I think the weakest thing right now is also your receiving. You yeah. race through it run, from beginning to end. You aren't really letting something land so that you need to counter. And you both knew each other rather than discovering each other, testing each other, finding out about each other with your thrust. Don't know what he's going to do. see. If you expect something else, how does this take you so that you need to find a counter? Don't go too quickly on tempo. You're going to not find the scene if you do. And I don't mean make deliberate pauses, but really receive before you need to send back and tap or undermine or cut or outrage or startle or scare or whatever. And the fun of that when you win, you know? OK, very good. By the way, I just wanted to say on that five-minute um, dictum that I give you, is not so I can see a lot of scenes, uh, or more scenes, or deal with more actors. If you take a scene that's more than five minutes, there are exceptions, of course, six minutes, seven and a half, or something. But the, the moment you take a scene too long and you have no director, you will intuitively start directing yourself. You say, I can't play this here. I've got to save it for there. You start to shape the scene directorially, rather than approaching it subjectively and see how much life you can bring into those five minutes. That's my reason for it, OK? Give it another whack. Absolutely. OK, good. Thank you. The fifth exercise is called Recreating Physical Sensations. Now, in part one, the sensory responses to visible and tangible objects that have been imaginatively endowed with properties that cannot or should not be real on stage. For instance, I don't want a real hot iron on stage. I might burn myself. Uh, I don't want real steam to come out of an iron on stage. I always tell the story about Mary Ewer, who was ironing in, in Look Back in Anger on Broadway here. And when the steam came out of the iron, first of all, the entire audience said, oh, look, real steam. Uh, that's that plugged in. And they left the, the stage. They, they had no reality anymore at all, because suddenly it was real steam. Secondly, she, one night, the steam, she got a steam burn, curtain. She was rushed to the hospital, and the performance was canceled. So the, those dangerous realities that can control you have to be found not by the reality, but by an endowed reality.
Okay. Okay. Now, that was kind of wonderful. Uh, uh, how did you feel? Um, pretty good. I think I anticipated a bit the, the, the sound. Um, uh, that I wondered about and what... Uh, well, I, I, I can see, sort of see that way, but not really because it's night, but only... But directing your attention there, I felt, came before you believed you heard. That was the only thing I would have criticized. Yeah. And I thought, because it became then, what's funny when we do an illustrated uh, action, it makes me speculate, why did she do that? Do you know what I mean? Now, if you had heard something and then looked there, yeah. I would have believed it. And you would have too. Yeah. But that's what you anticipated. Yeah. No, this, I had almost no criticism. And they had wonderful examples. My God, the wet clothes were just superb. And that always these actors who they have to come in from the rain, so they put their head, head under the tap water first, and then it dip, dip, drips all over the set, but they don't feel really wet anywhere else, you know. But th this was uh, the, uh, exemplary that that entrance, and the uh, the weight of the the water and the steam and the burning yourself and the chocolate. I mean, it was. I have no criticism, unfortunately. But. Uh, um, Oh, there's one other thing I want to say right at this point, is that all the exercises should ideally set up an automatic rehearsal process so that you rehearse all day long. You don't just rehearse when you set the time for it. I can't, uh, I, I can't go to an oven. Every time I open my oven at home, I see how I go back from the heat. Do you follow? In other words, uh, uh, the self-observation involved when you burn yourself, when you touch an iron, at which point you pull back the finger. The, because these are the things that create the reality of the sensation. Can you see from this exercise the endless variations? Opening a bottle that's supposed to be stuck. A sharp knife. I use a dull one and see what happens when it's supposed to be really sharp. So I can't hurt myself. OK. I think that's enough. Very good. Now, the second part of this exercise is where you endow physical sensations through the circumstances. In other words, weather, heat, cold, having to be quiet, being in a hurry. In other words, you're endowing the circumstances with realities which they don't quite have.
<laughs> what can you tell me? Oh, I screwed up. The match wasn't supposed to light. <laughs> it, it didn't. Lit. No, and it didn't. When you threw the thing, it went out. No, no, I, I lit the match too soon. I oh, had more oh. business with the oh, uh, match. Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> and that, and it, did, it lit, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I had to go. Well, I didn't see it, you see. So that didn't matter. You went with what happened. Anything else? Um, The, uh, certain, the balance wasn't as strong as it was in the No, I didn't think so either. By the way, drunkenness is probably the hardest condition in the world to play without indicating and without uh, uh, illustrating. Uh, and uh, you, you were on the, sometimes it was wonderful, but it wasn't, uh, I don't think it was consistent. I don't know why. Yeah. yeah what I did was I tried to make it, um, I wasn't concentrating enough, my head was very heavy. I think what I should have done, now that I think of it, is put it more in my knees. I think so, too. Yeah. I think, in other words, the thing is to localize one area. And each, each person, if you've ever been tight or, or, uh, or almost drunk at all, uh, it's the hardest one also, because when we're drunk, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to be self-observant while you're plastered. <laughs> The, uh, but if you go for one area of your body that is out of control, as one of the most suggestible to me when I'm standing, is my knees. And to allow them, uh, in other words, to, to give in to the desire, uh, to, to the fact that they feel wobbly. In other words, to give in to them, but then try to control it. Do you follow? You don't want to be. In other words, what most actors do, or most uh, people who play drunks, is that they want to be out of control, you see. Now, if, if, if your knees, if you're trying to get ahead and your knees go, you want to straighten up. Then your, head, then your head starts to carry you back, right? So, but you want the head to be straight. So there's continuously finding the vulnerability and overcoming it with a desire to do it correctly, right? right? right. And uh, it was like there on the, the knees, it was very good. And there was one point here where it was very good, but it was variable. Right? Right. The, uh, you had a degree of quiet. Right. You had, uh, um, what else? The bathroom. The, well, the toilet. Oh, yes. OK. <laughs> uh, now, again, yeah. staying drunk is harder sitting. When you sit, it's usually your head that wants to go, that you try to keep straight, you know? And then the attempt for, for normals. I didn't even do that on purpose, you see. Uh, and the attempt to, to get uh, and to focus, you see, to get to the right place for this, make sure that that's your cigarette, you know, <laughs> so that the, the, uh, the attempt is for normalcy. Right. Okay, now it's very good. Thank you. Thank you. And then I always say, why do I have to work on the exercise? If I say, I'm going to work on, I'm hired to play. <coughs> if I were a young man, to play the young man in uh, Bedtime Story by Sean O'Casey. And his first scene, he is, he's got a lost object. He's looking for a lipstick. It's pitch dark in the room. Uh, it is ice cold in the room. He has to be quiet because the landlady is downstairs. He has to, uh, uh, he spills, a, he knocks over a lamp and he's sopping wet and so forth and so on. There are like six conditioning forces at stake. I don't want to, at that point, learn how to stagger conditions and make them real to myself. I want to work on the character. Do you see what I mean? That's one of the 
glorious benefits of the object exercises that we so uh, uh, build such reflexes in the reality of behavior that when we come to the part, we can now concentrate on the part. Okay. She's like a force of nature, but she's not like a, like a, like a typhoon or anything. She's like the summer coming, you know? You start to realize that it's hot outside, so you take off your jacket. And then it's really hot, and then you gotta take off your shirt, and you hope that your undershirt is okay, you know? And then it gets really hot, and you have to decide whether you're gonna get buck naked or just put a bathing suit on. And you know that if you are not prepared for her, or if you're getting ready to waste her time, it's really not a good idea, you know? Now I have, what time is it? Oh, it's already 20 past time. I think we should have, at this point, a question and answer period on where we are, okay? I'll get up there and you formulate your questions. On anything that has arisen about your scenes or theory or anything you like. All right, yes. When you have a scene partner that um, wants you to do something that you feel is illogical, how do you deal with that when you don't have a director? even when the director is there. If an actor gets illogical, go with him in the illogic, and then it suddenly doesn't fit the dialogue, and then they stop. Let's say an example that I make, which is very visual, so you'll know. If the actor goes out too soon, he has to make an exit, and I have to say, uh, come on, why, why are you leaving? And he's gone already. I don't say you're leaving too soon, because then he just gets mad at me and thinks I'm directing him. So I let him go. Then I don't say my line. He comes back and says, you didn't say your line. I said, you were gone. <laughs> and then there's no discussion anymore. Do you know, another thing we were just discussing about physical violence on stage, when I was in Streetcar with Tony Quinn, he knocked me black and blue. I mean, he really, and every performance I'd say, Tony, please, I put more makeup on my body than on my face because I'm bruised from head to toe. Well, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I felt it. You know? So this went on for weeks. And one day I was sitting on the desk, and he has to come toward me and shake me. And I saw, saw him come towards me. The thumbs were already out. I knew which muscle they were going to land in. You know, <laughs> And they sure enough, they did, and they landed. And I went, oh, 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 oh. And he stopped. <laughs> And he forgot all his lines, and he went, well, oh, oh. and uh, I, funny, I got him back into the dialogue, and we came off stage, he said, you're not supposed to say that there. I said, I felt it. <laughs> he never hurt me again. <laughs> fun, fun. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. As far as the um, fundamentals of how you, when you work, and score your uh, piece of it. Do you um, blow it up onto a big sheet of paper and work from there, or do you write your own lines? How do you, you see, that is totally personal. Wow. It's whatever is stimulating to you. I have on some things thick workbooks, on others a few pages. I make little personal notes about substitutions and transferences that I make. For instance, Virginia Woolf. Martha, who is the daughter of the university president, very strong academic background in terms of her, her life, faculty parties and so on. Well, my father was a professor. I uh, was raised in a, in a faculty uh, atmosphere, in an academic atmosphere. So that in, to substantiate those realities was so, I mean, I just made it direct. It matched. She adored her father, so did I. You know, so that much of it was done. If I go to St. Joan, I'm in a big, I got a big problem. I got a lot of work to do. Do you see? Okay. Yes. When is too much too much or it's never too much? Like Nothing is too much if it has reality. What is too much is pushing, mugging, illustrating, indicating is too much, is wrong. But a full experience, no matter how Huge it can be is not too much, in my opinion. Yes? Because we do a lot of film and television, um, we're faced with the fact that our destination is a mark on the floor. 
I mean, how do I take that and apply it? The mark on the floor is still either near a table, near a chair. It's not spaceless. So the principle is identical. Why do I go to that table? Then you'll hit your mark more easily, too. OK, why do I go over there? Right. And that's your own, your, your own I mean, most directors don't give you justification. You've got to find your own anyway. Right, right. In, on stage two. <laughs> OK, yes. Could you tell the opera story, the one about true intention? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what I always say, if on stage, a true intention, it's like a chorus line. It's the, the, all the chorus girls are lined up. And one of them takes a peek at the audience to see if her agent is there. You know, It's like being shot by a bullet. Now everybody is singing and going, and this one person goes, and everybody jumps, you know. So uh, the story, Herbert and I went to a dress rehearsal of Lone Green God Help Us at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I kept saying, I don't want to go 10 o'clock in the morning to a three-hour opera. I just can't bear it. Herbert said, come on, it'll be interesting. So we went. And on stage, as the curtain went up, there were rocks and levels and later on swans going by and I don't know what all. And people in with singers with horns and the, the furs and then long robes and everything. And there on one of these rocks were tons of extras. And right in front was an extra who had obviously never been on stage in his life and didn't know what he was doing there. So while they're singing and going and carrying on, he had on one of these uh, armor hats, and he had the, uh, the knitted uh, chainmail gloves, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. And the curtain went up. <laughs> he looked, there were a half a dozen people, and the director and the, the, Mr. Bing, the head of the Met. Then somebody here sang very loudly, and he was. <laughs> he started looking at the scenery. He started looking at the other. And then, then after he had a lot of looks like this, and we were weeping. <laughs> he got bored with all that stuff that was going on around. And he began to. Then his hat started to bother him. <laughs> it went on an hour, an hour. And then finally the hat couldn't bear it anymore. Anyhow, an hour and a half. It was an experience not to be forgotten. This is all you could see on that stage, no matter how many people were screaming and yelling and choruses were singing and uh, all the swans were moving and lone green and, and all you could see was this man. Beautiful. Okay. Good. Okay, any more questions? anymore. It is now 10 and 1. Let's call it quits. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yes, we're finished now. You know, you were in my first class. I'll never forget it. I remember it as though it were yesterday. The essence of a really good actor is that you stay in a 
stay innocent, stay curious to the day you die. Don't know the answers. Try to figure out, you know, and try to understand. And you see that which makes us unique and which allows you to imagine that you live in another time, in another place, in another room, that you really believe that is based on innocence. That's why we act so wonderfully when we're children, because we really believe. And that ability to believe we should keep to the day we die and don't let anybody take it away from you. Certainly don't take it away from yourself. somewhere could uh walk out by the lake or over to Overton's hotel they're dancing till midnight or we could just walk I, I can't i've got to be back in 10 minutes i shouldn't even be out here now 10 minutes are, are you serious I, I just came in from Biloxi. i i know but it's good friday isn't that a holiday no it's a holy day it's the day that christ our lord died we have to abstain from parties or movies or dates day of prayer and mourning. Doesn't sound like Good Friday to me. It sounds like lousy Friday. <sighs> Ten minutes. Jesus. I'm sorry. No Jesus. I, I can't believe it. It's my fault. I should have told you my last letter. We can make up for it next week, can't we? I, I'm not sure that I'm going to be here next Friday. We, we just finished basic training yesterday. We could be shipping out any day now. Shipping out? To where? You're up the Pacific. They haven't told us yet. Overseas so soon? They can't keep us here forever. The Army needs reinforcements. We've already lost a sergeant and a private. We're still in Biloxi. Can't you stay out just a little later, just tonight? I know I'm Jewish, but I don't think Christ your Lord's going to hold it against you personally. I can't. I've got to be faithful to my beliefs, Eugene. About being faithful to me. I have been. I haven't been to another USO dance since we met. I just don't feel like dancing with anyone else you mean anymore. That? Cross my heart. No, 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 no. You don't have to cross your heart. Religion's always getting in our way. I believe you. <clears throat> Daisy, I, I, I. What, Eugene? I want to say something, but I'm having a lot of trouble with my words. Well, that doesn't sound like Eugene the writer to me. No, that's because I'm not writing right now. I'm Eugene the talker. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that. Uh, Damn it, I, I, I just wish I could say it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that, especially on Good Friday. I'll say ten Hail Marys for you. No, you don't have to say that. They're not going to do me any good. <laughs> what is it you wanted to say, Eugene? Daisy, you know what it is. Just I've never said it to a girl before in my life. I don't know how it's going to sound when it comes out. Well, say it, and I'll tell you. I love you, Daisy. That's, that sounded all wrong. That, that's not how I meant it at all. I've never heard it said so beautifully. Wait, what do you mean? How many guys have said it to Oh, you? none. <laughs> I meant in the movies, not uh, Tyrone Power or, or Robert Taylor or even Clark Gable. Yeah, well, they get paid for saying it. I'm in business for myself. I remember everything you say to me, Eugene. When I go home at night, I write them all down and I read them over when... Whenever I miss you. Yeah, well, if you're going to keep your, your memoirs, just make sure your locker's closed. I don't want to be the talk of St. Mary's. It's 8 o'clock. I've got to go. But you haven't said it to me yet. That I love you? No, 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 not like that. You can't just sneak it in all quickly like that. You, you have to take a breath and prepare for it and then say it. All right. I've taken a breath. Now I'm preparing for it. And now I'll say it. 
I love you, Eugene. We can't kiss. It's Good Friday. Well, you have to kiss after you say I love you. <laughs> you just don't even God for it would forgive you that. All right. I love you, Eugene. Oh, I, I almost forgot. This is for you. It's a book. Oh, really? What book? Uh, I love you taste in books. Well, it's blank pages. <laughs> for your memoirs. Page one can start with tonight. Take care of yourself, Eugene Morris Jerome. And even if some other girl gets you, I'll always know you were my first love. Okay, I'm working with them. I, I completely forgot everything as far as my physical goes and then found myself... Do you see, you can't imagine you have to rehearse the physical life. You have to open up the seams of it and if anything, do too much and then see what you need and what becomes logical and how you go away from and come back to. It's very possible that you might sit right away. I don't know, but you've decided you should stand, do you see? You have 10 minutes. You don't have 30 seconds. You have 10 minutes. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Now, it, I think you haven't followed through on the things you might do, not feel or think, but do. Do you see? Yeah. OK. Now, something interesting you did at the beginning, which again arises in many, many scenes, you come in, he doesn't hear you, and you're surprised. I heard her. Why didn't you? Actually, I was thinking about the pen. So. You're not thinking about the pen. You're saying I shouldn't respond to her until she touches my shoulder. And that's a mistake. Now, you know the director who says, you come in, you come in, and there he is. And you see him. The director says, no, 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 you don't see him yet. <laughs> now, you know you're laughing because that happens all the time, right? <laughs> so now I come in and I play. <laughs> and I don't see you yet. Now I got to see you. Oh, you know, oh my God. So don't do that to yourself. Right? Don't give yourself bad summer stock directions. Uh, when you hear her, hear her. You're waiting for her. Do you see? You maybe didn't know good that you didn't know she was coming from there. Maybe you hope she's coming from here or from there. But then when you hear her, go with what you hear. Right? OK. Hear what you hear and see what you see. And go, go with the responses to that. OK. If you have a, a briefcase with you, what's in it? What did you bring it for? What did you bring with you? Did you bring a, a scratch pad with you to make notes for your next novel? Do you see? Then you will find true occupation. This way, it's just a prop. It doesn't serve you. OK? But the main thing is start with your physical life. And the outdoor scene is always harder than an indoor scene. Did you try it outdoors or not? You yeah. did. Yes, we did it. Uh, what was around you there? Mostly field. Field. A, a field. Trees. Uh, tr where was the building? Where was the building? It, when we set it? Or yeah. When we worked? No, when you were working outdoors. Oh, the actual building? Yeah. Was up to the left. Okay. Did you look to see if anybody was coming out of it while you were rehearsing? I bet you did. If anybody's watching you while you're making eyes at each other? I don't know. I, I'm just saying the influence of the surroundings in terms of behavior, not thinking and feeling, but behavior. Give it another crack. Okay. All right. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Yes. I read your um, book in the section on transference several, several times, and um, like I really worked on it, but I'm never clear if like I'm doing it like right, you know. You won't be doing right until you start with your body. Yeah. Okay. OK, and where okay. it is, and what it's doing there. Then we can start feeling. OK. OK? OK. It's in the doings that you believe in. Not sitting thinking heat 
or thinking glare or thinking these things, but what do I do to overcome it? And in the moment of finding the action, you have the sensation. To bring about the things that the scenic designer can't give you. That's the purpose of this exercise. Okay, some of that was wonderful. Now, how did you feel? Um, I felt um, I felt private, you know, and, and my own thing. But the hard thing was um, try to fulfill what the exercise is supposed to be, and not feeling like this pressure to like, okay, I got to show this, I got to show that, I got to go from this to this, I got to no, in no, three no, minutes, I got to do all that, I got to like. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, you didn't, uh, didn't fall into that trap. I didn't see any of that. I thought it was wonderful. Can you criticize anything? Anything you've doubted for a second? Um, hmm. I bet you won't, because you did it twice, so I knew that you didn't, weren't aware of it the first time. Usually, something like the sand, which is very suggestible, was wonderful, right away with the toes while you were lying at the opening. It was just marvelous. Then. After the, the first brushing yourself off, it had no consequence, and you r right. rubbed sand in your eyes. I thought, oh, his hand, because I was so, right, 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 right. I was so sensitive to it, and, and you finally mm -hmm. got this off the thing, and then you went, and I thought, ow, I, he just got sand in his eye. You're right, and that was a hard thing in working on it, too. But usually, I would find myself like, oh, my God, wait a minute. I'm, but know. it's usually so suggestible right. that it sets up that correct reflexes. Right and... Uh, uh, the fly was wonderful, uh, the sand fly. Uh, 
There was an, and when you shook the shirt out, which was wonderful, I had the feeling it got on your stomach. Mm -hmm. And you see, and, and it wasn't sensorily completed. Exactly. If you had allowed yourself more, more faith in that, yeah. it would have uh, followed through all by itself. Okay. It, it, this is when I love theater, because that's magic. When I start to see a sand up there, and I'm on a beach, and I start to feel the sun and get the glare, and it was marvelous, George. Very good. All right. Uh, occupation is what gives us a presence on stage. And it doesn't have to be out or running around and doing the dishes and leaping into bed. What do I do when I seemingly have nothing to do? I'm waiting for a bus, or I'm waiting for a subway, or I'm waiting for somebody in a park. It's the ultimate test, this exercise, and, and how to put yourself into a time and place and truly be occupied without a whole lot of stuff. Okay, now how did you feel? Pretty good. It was pretty good. It's amazing for a first one. Uh, if anything, if you would criticize anything, what it would be in your selection? Um, well, and one technical difficulty is I um, that, but I don't, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough to do so that you're almost avoiding the problem. Ah, okay, yeah. Right? right. So you select less activities and see how, the interesting thing when this exercise, where well, you could have gone on another five minutes, couldn't you? And it wouldn't have bothered least, you. Right. That's what was good about it. And when it's correct, we feel fully occupied. If we know where we are, what we're doing there, what we're wearing, where, we, where we're going, where we came from. And when I say what we're wearing, how the clothing influences how you stand. If you had on shoes that were too tight or a, um, an evening jacket or an evening shirt, you would, uh, if we're going someplace fancy, you would behave quite differently. Isn't that true? Sure. And those are the considerations w why this is a little bit easier to do here in this exercise than it is on stage, is that when we're on stage in a problem like this, we are wearing a costume instead of our own clothes. We haven't endowed them with the reality so that they belong to us. We very often are spare on inner objects that come from the given circumstances, which are different for, for the character in the play than they would be for you. And uh, so that it's more difficult to execute on the stage. But the principle of it remains the same. You didn't give yourself enough room in between when you were caught by an inner consideration of something that had happened, something that will happen, what you're going to do when you get there. And you can be caught by an inner object that produces thought where you can be totally still for quite a while. Right. And when it wears out for you, then you go to an outer object again. Uh, give yourself more inner objects and more room to deal with them instead of always going from activity to activity. 
Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. man comes here every day and every day I know the reason why he comes. I'm staying already. I should fall on my knees and beg Sonia's forgiveness. Yesterday you said you had some maps you would show me. I have them. Are you free? Extreme exhaustion. I forsake my practice and I steal away to spend an hour or two over my maps. Ivan Petrovich and Sofia Alexandrovna are clicking away at the abacus. I'm seated beside them at my work table, painting away. I'm warm. Everything is quiet. I'm at peace. I hear the crickets outside. All right. Look here. Here's our district, 50 years ago. Dark and light greens indicate the forests. As you see, half of the whole was wooded. Now where we find green crosshats with red, we have the range of Elks, wild goats, and we show both the flora and the fauna here. Now on the lake, we have swans, geese, ducks, and as the old folks say, the power of birds. As they would say, as far as the eye could see and farther. A cloud of birds, just flying. Okay, now, what can you tell me? Lindsay? I have the hardest time beginning. You don't know why? It's so easy. You see, you're very skillful, so it doesn't show as much, but the, your problem is identical. Talking to yourself is involuntary. Very often we don't know it. I talk to myself a lot. It took me years to realize it. People walk in and say, who are you talking to? You know? <laughs> now, the, I don't talk to myself when I am physically still. That's why you're having trouble. You see, oh. that's the only you reason you're having trouble. You have to have an activity. And, you have to, and it doesn't have to be completed, and it doesn't have to get all the way finished. Right. You see, what you're missing is the vanity. Now, when we have a crush on someone, which you do have on Astro, big one, uh, we become very self-aware of our bodies, of everything. Now, in what you might choose, I go to the most obvious, you, I hope you'll reject that, which is to fix your face. 
or fix your hair or put a drop of perfume on your kerchief or I give myself 10 things I could do and I try them all always remembering that the purpose uh, is not to finish the activity but to know what it what it, it would be what it would be in any monologue by the way I always say what would I do here if I didn't talk and I explore all of that and then at some point it's going to be very easy to start talking right. okay now um, the sensory life you see, the, the, here you stood. He was there. Neither of you were physically aware of each other. Right? Did she have on scented soap? You see her hair here? Do you see her hands? She's listening to you. She's looking at the papers. She's going, and you're showing her your work. Now, you see, when you hear him talk, this, you try to listen to this, the tone of his voice, his soap, his leather jacket, I mean, this is so loaded, do you see, with sensuality. I know, I thought that what I was trying to do in the scene was to steel myself against that. But I know, but this is your biggest problem as an actress. You find a mask and you stick to the mask. You forget what's underneath. Never mind these masks. Uh, take them off. And if it's inadequate for the character, I'll tell you. But uh, don't... Uh, don't play the cover so successfully. You end up succeeding in the covers. You lose what's, what's cooking, right? No, you can play it, but it is a, I think that every actor has a huge range of parts which are this big. There's a whole bunch back there he can't play. And I don't mean that there isn't something in the nature of this character that uh, is hard for you. No question about it. I was very interested when you were going to work on the scene. I, then I thought, Elena, how? Then I couldn't wait. So you see. Okay. Now, um, Brian, how did you feel? The two biggest issues of this, are the primary one being my relationship with Elena. Secondary, this man that I've come to show, and I. I've always had this trouble, of, and I call it spinning, where it's almost like I run up against it and I come back, and I run up against it and I come back, and I run up against it, and I never go through it. I never can find a way of connecting myself to that relationship or to that objective or to that meaning. And it and, is uh, terribly hard. I tell you what, what I think it is. I'm not sure, but I think so. You've made a beautiful map, by the way. I always go crazy with what the actor brings in as a map. The last, one, the last one I picked up and I said, was that an empty page? And he, I went and he said, yeah. And you knew that it was an empty page. So that map is crucial. What is missing is that you're not passionate enough about it. You, this is truly the most meaningful thing in your life, is that pursuit of the ecology, which nobody understands. A hundred years ago, Chekhov was concerned with something that is bugging us now. It's fantastic. Now, you see, if you say link it, the opportunity to share that with a person you have got the hots for in no mean terms, right, is so exciting that it's just fantastic. Where can I go to make that map more important? I'm trying to find issues. Take something that you really feel passionate about and now transfer it to that map. Okay, good. All right, I think that's it. The reason we talk aloud to ourselves is always to gain control over circumstances. And the circumstances can be boredom. I can start playing fancy games with myself because what I'm doing is so tedious in a big dramatic monologue, it's that you are in crisis and need the words to help yourself find answers. Many, many people say, no, I don't talk to myself. Of course, it's not true. I had an auditor in a class who, while I was teaching this exercise, marched up front, turned to the class and me and said, nobody talks to themselves unless they're crazy. So I said, please, uh, you're an auditor. That means listen, don't talk, and then go and sit down. 
So I didn't see this, but I was told afterwards by my key student and people sitting in the back that he was furious. He sat down and for the rest of the class said, I don't know what she's talking about. That's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and talked to the end of the class, but he never talks to himself. <laughs> I'm living without you. Mm -hmm. Gotta be free. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm living without you. Doesn't a Visa card just for cat enthusiasts sound great? Yes. Oh, God, it's hot in here. My glasses. My glasses. My glasses. Forever losing this. Things. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my, you bad kitties, you bad, bad kitties. You, I know you're here somewhere. I have had it. Where are you? I have had it all. Oh my God, look at this mess. God, my Oh my God, my statue, I just got this. Oh, my God. Oh, they're all broken. I see. under there. Come here. Come here. Come here. I have had it. All I do is clean up this goddamn mess. Oh my god. What am I going to do with this brat? Come here. Ooh. What is that? <laughs> oh god. Puking everywhere. <laughs> so sick of this. Every time I go somewhere, they clean up and have this junk all over the place. Now I can't have a goddamn piece of plant or anything here. They eat all my goddamn plants. They uproot everything. Look at this. I think I give them enough toys. Jesus Christ. All right, I'm just going to put them all in a cage. I'm going to put you all in a cage when I go somewhere. So sick of this. Is that what you want to do? You want to stay in a fucking cage? I don't give a shit. <laughs> I just quit this goddamn rug. <laughs> they steal my curlers. All my curlers are gone. <laughs> okay. Nah, how did you feel? 
Uh, I, I, it didn't work the element of discovery of this for me, really. That it was, was the, only, of, the only note I had, was the, discovering the, the room. And I don't know why, every time I come home, I'm so... And, no, no, no. <laughs> what was missing was, you see, you demanded something when you first saw it. You demanded instantaneous discovery of yeah. everything. Yeah, okay. And you see, if you demand, if you see one right. thing, and you have to give yourself, every time you do it, the leeway that is going to move in on you slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may move in on you more quickly. Mm -hmm. Other times you may, I have, right. you see, in disbelief, I have even, you know, picked things up and said, you know, but you're demanding an immediate horror. Right. Yes. And I think that was the uh, that first was the plant, then the then the picture, and yeah, this, I did, I did, and I I had did it, I did. Also, it. you see, even in turning, the expectation of what the room usually looks like. Yeah. Not the way it looks now, but the way it's supposed to look, and then it can move in on you. That was my only criticism. I thought all oh, the rest was just wonderful. <laughs> Again, why do we laugh? We laugh when we recognize ourselves. You see, that the real communication of laughter is always in, in the revelation of, my God, that's what I do. You know? OK. <laughs> the difference is, you're the adult, and she's the child. I don't believe in that authority crap. I have that up to here. Well, that's why it's so hard for me. Oh, I make it hard for you, I suppose. Well, you make me the bad one. What, what happened to this book? I come out the villain. This was a new book. Look at it already. Jesus, Hitler didn't do to books what you do. <laughs> she calls daddy and you come running. I don't come running and that makes me Hitler? Well, now who's talks an extreme? Look, a little respect for the printed what? word, what? that's all, Louise. You, know, <laughs> you ever make her come to you? Why do you always go to her? You want me to play power games with a nine-year-old? I want her to know I'm interested in her. Someone around here has to show interest in her. Oh, you love her more than I do. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You don't know how to listen. You never learned how to listen. It's as if... Is it listening to you is, is a foreign I'm language? I'm trying to drill some responsibility in her during the day. And you come home at night and do everything. It's no wonder that she has no respect for me. I am not going to listen to this. Okay? I'm not going to take a drink. I, I didn't even want one. See. Okay. 
When you worked on the material, what was hard for you, the hardest for you? William? I think most difficult for me was making clear which issue was most vital to me. So I guess I was still working on and trying to figure out what to think about. Okay. And Cynthia, what was hardest for you? Um, the hardest thing was trying to find like the transitions because it start when we were doing it, it would like be all at one level, and then it would be here, here, and so like to find where it kind of where it went to, and just staying like just staying in the moments rather than kind of like cause it, it got very general. We were rehearsing it, even though I was being I thought it was being specific in my homework. It didn't. It was hard bringing it to the scene. Now, when you read it, how what would you classify this play? How would you classify this play? What kind of play is it? If I had to label it, um, I would say it was a drama. And you? Yeah, a family drama. See, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a comedy. It's a comedy. Uh, now, you see, if it's a drama, it is such an ugly play that I don't know why anybody would want to do it or see it. Well, maybe that was the problem. I think that's the problem. That's what I'm getting at. You see, I think you have to find, to make the play tolerable and find variations, because it's, each scene is the same throughout the whole play. Now, how can you sustain that if it is really that ugly? Now, I'm not a director, and I don't know the play intimately so that I know I'm right, but I think I'm right. So to explore it, see what happens. In something like a fight, if two people love each other, a fight can be hilarious. And I got into a fight with my husband that uh, while it was going on, I knew it was ludicrous. It was so funny, but I didn't stop doing what I was doing. You see? Now, what is the fun in fighting, if there is such a thing? Is the enjoyment of one-upmanship. Do you see? Now, I think if you look for that, you're going to find so many variations in this. What have you used before as a weapon? When does it work? When does it fail? When are you hit by it? So you need to find a, 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 another one to top him with or to best him with. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. The crying. When do you know that the crying is going to undo him? How right. good can you do it for him? Do you see? Right. See even the drinking. You know, getting it out, showing it to her. Do you see, rather than being a true alcoholic who's now going to go back to booze and she gets terrified, it doesn't, if you look at where the, the next beat goes, it doesn't go there where you're trying to take it. Do you see? Yeah, that, that's the problem. We kept coming up against that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where we were taking it, then it didn't really go there. That's right. And we didn't really know what else to do. That's <laughs> right. And I think if you look for that, you're going to have a field day with it. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. Thank Thanks. you. Well, see, old line, comedy is very serious business. Good comedy on a good script, and let's say you've been fortunate and been sent a good script with a good part, it's very seldom that the guy is zany and thinks that he's funny. That's one thing, if you're supposed to think you're funny. But the minute an audience thinks that you think you're funny, you're dead. I have a wonderful recording. I'm so blessed of a Dick Cavett uh, interview with Noel Coward on his 70th birthday and the Lunts. And it's a masterpiece, it really is. And there's one point where they, they were talking about, the Lunts were talking about how they worked with each other and the problems, and, 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 and Mr. Lunt said, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was so strange, I kept saying to Linny in this play, the line where I asked for the cup of tea, it's so funny in that circumstance. And I, and I said to her, <laughs> Why can't I get a laugh there? And she said, you don't know? And he said, no. She said, because you're asking for a laugh instead of for a cup of tea. <laughs> you see? Why do you always make her come to you? What's the difference? The difference is discipline. Bullshit. The difference is that you're the adult and she's the child. I don't believe in that authority crap. Yeah, well, that's that why it's so here. hard for me. Oh, I make it hard. You, you make, so make me the bad one. <laughs> I come up with villains. <laughs> what happened to this book? Jesus Christ, this was a new book. 
Look at this already. Hitler didn't do the books what you do. <laughs> she calls daddy and you come running? I don't come running and that makes me Hitler? Oh, well, now who's talking? No, no a, a little respect for the printed Why word. Why do you ever make her come to see you? Why do you always go to her? Oh, Jesus, you want me to have play power games with a nine-year-old? I want her to know I'm interested in her. Someone around here has to show interest. Oh, so you love her more than I do. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You don't know how to listen. You never learned how to listen. It's as if listening to I you is a foreign to language. I tried responsibility in her during oh, the day. Right. You come home at night and do everything. No one shows no respect for me. I, I am not going to listen to this. <laughs> the other way in a strange way served you for when you let it go. I'm not recommending that you should start wrong in order to get it right. <laughs> but in this, in this instance, I really think it had something to do because it was so full. I have, I have no criticism. I mean, a few little tiny things that are what? not worth talking about. <laughs> I 
I just thought it was a field day, a real give and take, and going with it. It was a delicious. Can I just follow you around? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you learned so much from this. Just wonderful. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very, very good. Questions? Yes? Why do you say to, to cross out the stage directions? When I say very emphatically when you read the play, cross out the stage directions, what I really mean is all adjectives. In other words, happily, gladly, sadly, like a moth. I, I never could play, I never, I never could play that opening beat of Streetcar because it's just like a moth banging against the light bulb, you know, and I had this image of, you know. I thought, oh, God, leave me alone. Eugene O'Neill's descriptions, his novels he writes before, before you come on, block me tremendously. Yes. What should you discuss with your scene partner? Definitely discuss what your objectives are and make sure they're in conflict. Because I can say, my objective is to get you out of here, and the other one says, my objective is to get out. Well, you've got nothing to play. <laughs> right? So make sure that they're in, in conflict. Do not discuss the actions. Don't say, I, oh, I'm going to do such and such. Then you become an audience. They say, he's not doing what he just said he was going to do. In other words, and you won't be surprised by them. So never discuss the actions. You can talk about the relationship of what you've done together, previous circumstances, improvise how you deal with each other in a normal day, but don't discuss the psychological life of the scene too much. Get up and do it. There's much too much talk, usually, including gossip before you start working. Come and work. Start working. Okay, good. I do so much homework, and uh, then, ideally, of course, you forget it all when you get on the, uh, in front of the camera or on the stage. You just, you have done all this preparation so that you can be really open. And it's interesting how... So many actors out here, especially in film, they don't like to rehearse and they don't like to do homework because they feel like it's going to take away their spontaneity. And it's so interesting because for me, the more rehearsal I do, the more homework I have done, the freer I am, the more spontaneous I can be when the cameras are rolling or when I'm on stage. I'll tell you a funny story. I played once uh, a streetcar with Marlon Brando without any rehearsal to standing room only audience because uh, uh, he was already then totally undisciplined and had taken a uh, two weeks vacation and during which I played with Tony Quinn and then he was supposed to come back from his vacation we were going to rehearse and then we were going to play so he arrived five minutes after half hour was called this the producer said well what do you want to do and I said I don't know I said the and I said to Marlon, you want to try five minutes and see what happens? He said, <laughs> he said I'm game. And I said, OK. And we rehearsed about five minutes. And I thought, oh, I think this will, might work. He had never seen me. I had never seen him. We really had totally, I had a totally different interpretation than Jessica. And he had a totally different layout than, than, than Quinn. It worked like a charm. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it was rather. Uh, uh, unnerving. But, and why it worked was that we had both rehearsed and played a lot in that set with those objects. We never lost circumstances. I, I'm very attuned to my partner, no matter if I've played with him a long time or a little time, I will be tuned in. And it, it worked. Now, that can only work if circumstances, relationship, place, every tiny object is familiar to me. Yes. What do you do when a mistake or an accident happens on stage during a performance? If a true accident happens, if it is plausible within the circumstances, deal with it. So and, uh, but if you, you see, if, if it looked like a mistake, then the actor was saying, oh, I'm sorry, and saying, I'm get, I've got to get over a mistake, rather than saying, oh, my God, I'm sorry, did I do that? Let me get something and mop him up. And nobody will know it was a mistake. They'll think it was in there on purpose. OK? So what you can't cover is when the scenery falls down. 
<laughs> I, I have another. I also think, you see, if you're playing mechanically or playing posing, any mistake will look terrible. I'll never forget a classical actress who shall remain nameless. Uh, in, in a Grecian toga, uh, walking from here to there, and walking, and she tripped. <laughs> Um, if she had been walking and she, she tripped over her dress, it would have been nothing. But because it didn't fit the mold, uh, it looked ludicrous. Okay. <laughs> now, the purpose of this exercise, which follows talking to yourself, is to discover all the problems that occur when we have to talk to the audience. I played a lot of plays like that, and it was always unbelievably difficult for me if I left the circumstances in which the play took place. Let's assume it's the Brecht. Uh, 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 there are many monologues for, for uh, the character Shente, whom I played, where she talks to the audience about what she's doing. And if I went from 18th century China to a contemporary audience at the Phoenix Theater where I played it, there were two such totally different realities that I could never recover. So I created for myself imaginary people that were from the little village in China where I lived, who were passers-by, who were observing what I'd been doing so that I, I didn't lose my character or my time and place by looking at the audience here. Direct eye contact with people who sit in the auditorium. Anybody who tells you you should make eye contact with them is crazy. And I say to prove the point to yourself, remember the times when you have sat in an audience and a performer has looked right at you. You immediately get very self-conscious Women always start adjusting their brassiere straps, you know. <laughs> She's looking at me. What is expected of me? What does she want? Now, that can't help the actor if he's, he's made somebody very uncomfortable. So in order not to make eye contact, I take my imaginary people and place them in the audience, either directly over their heads or in aisles, and I now address them. Everybody here thinks I'm talking to them. You will feel included, more included, than if you actually make eye contact. You know, if, if there's a spill of light here uh, from the stage that makes these eyes visible, and those are just bodies, that's fine. You can look at bodies, but they won't feel attacked, and you won't feel that they interfere with your reality. So now, how do I talk to somebody like that? So I've given the actor in this the problem of placing somebody in their own space, imaginarily here, and telling them something to see how this can work. Oh, boy. I had a great time. <clears throat> mm. Best time is when I'm doing stuff with my nephews and nieces. Um, like, for the past three years, every Christmas Eve day, I get a pad and a pencil, and I write down the names of all my sisters and all their kids and all my friends that have kids. There's so damn many of them, if I don't write them down, I forget them all. So I take a pad, I write down all their names, and I call all their parents, and I ask, you know, what did the kids ask for from Santa Claus this year? And then I write down, I have a list, so this way, I'm, you know, I'm in the know. So the day goes on, I usually go to, well, this year I went to an early mass with my folks, Christmas Eve, and we went back at dinner. And during dessert, when we're having coffee, I grab the list, and um, I grab the, uh, the phone, and I start calling up. So this year, I called my, um, my little niece, niece uh, Rachel, who lives in Dallas, Texas. So I called her on the phone, and I said, hello? Is this Rachel? She said, yes. I said, this is Santa. She says, hi, Santa. And I said, well, in about 15 minutes, we'll be pulling out. So we're just going over the list one last time to make sure there aren't any errors. I said, we just want to make sure everything's correct. And she says, okay, Santa. And so what I do is I go through the list, but I always fuck up one thing, just, you know, to, to keep them on their toes. 
So, I, you know, for example, like she wanted a Barney doll. So I said, Barbie. So I said, and that'll be a Barbie doll. She said, oh, no, no. She says, Barney. And I go, oh, Rudolph. I said, Rudolph, that second sack there on the left. I said, make sure. I said, Rachel doesn't want a, a, a Barbie doll. She wants a Barney doll. See if we can make a last minute substitution. And then the kid, you know, totally goes for it. And I, I yell orders to the elves, to the reindeer. So we do the thing, right? So um, uh, it's hysterical. But the, the thing is, I can't laugh, because if I laugh, I blow Santa Claus for the kid, right? So um, then I say, well, will you be leaving something for Santa and the reindeer to eat? And she says, yes, Santa. And I say, well, will you be leaving this year? She says, oh, some cookies and some milk for Santa. And I said, and what about the reindeer? She said, some, some um, carrots and some celery. And I said, well, that's nice. I said, do you think maybe you could leave a, a tall glass of warm water with three tablespoons of sugar dissolved in it? And she says, uh-huh. And I said, and, you know, you think your mom has a can of sardines? And so she says, um, you hear, mom? She says, yeah. And my sister's in the background yelling, yeah. She says, do we have any sardines? And she goes, who are you talking to? She says, Santa. So then you hear this pause in the background. So you know that my sister's sitting there processing, you know, what the hell's going on? And she can't laugh. She's got to go with it because it's Santa Claus. So um, <laughs> I had my other niece leave cheese. I told them Santa had a hankering for some cheese. I said, and do you think you can ask your mom to cut the cheese this year? So, of course, it goes way over his head. I'm dying. And um, my little nephew, I told him that I had a hankering for some pickles. I said, do you think you can ask your mom to dice those pickles really small? I said, because we'll be in a hurry. We won't have time to chew, and I don't want anyone choking on the way out the door. So, of course, these kids don't go to bed until my sisters or brothers go through all of this stuff, right? It was hysterical. Okay. Now, how did you feel? I felt pretty good. You made some interesting errors. Do you know what they are? Um, hit me. <laughs> all right. The first moment, where were they? Right there. What, what is it anchored to? To the right of the young lady with the red sweater and microphone. Uh, okay, to that mic. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. Now, you didn't establish that reality for you when you started talking. I jumped right in. Yeah, you jumped right in without finding the person you want to direct it to. So the first moment was muddy. Do you okay. understand what I yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have much too many activities. Okay. Now I want you to try it again right. and find where you stop to tell the story. All right. Okay. All right. Now whether you pull pull, pull the chair around or sit where you are. Sit where I am right now, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You see. Now try it again. Let it with uh, without further thought, yeah. and see what happens. Oh, I had a great time. The best time was when I'm spending time with my nephews and nieces. <clears throat> so I, for the past three years now, every um, Christmas Eve day, I write down all the kids' names, all my sisters and all their kids and all my friends that have kids. And there's so many of them. If I don't write them down, I'm never going to remember them. So um, at any rate, I write down all their names, and then I call their parents, and I find out what it is that the kids want for Christmas from Santa this year. So that way I'm in the know. And... Um, I call, I get the list, and the day goes on. And um, I went to Mass this year with my parents in early Mass. We had dinner. Then um, <clears throat> after dinner, we're having coffee and dessert. And I grab the, the list, and I grab the phone, and I start calling everybody. Okay, okay, this is fine. You see? Now we can hear you. Okay. Now what's interesting is that you just where you got up and got the plate, I was going to say you don't have to stay there. So you followed through on an impulse that was absolutely correct. But if the task becomes so primary. Right. I felt that as I, as I began. That's I what I wanted to do. Especially with the silver, I mean, this is too primary. Yeah, yeah. Back off. But um, <laughs> no, what is so important, what I continue, continue, continue to find strength in, no matter what I'm working on, is that sense of place. Absolutely. And the more you know where the hell you are, absolutely. It make, you're grounded. Absolutely. Then you can add other things. But if you don't have that, there's nothing. Nothing. Now, this was a very good example, and it worked beautifully, especially the second time through. Okay? okay? All right. Very good.
sleepy countenances, these dull faces, this, this death of life. A great coward that I am. When a man comes here every day, and every day I know the reason why he comes. Oh, God. I'm stained already. I must fall on my knees to Sonia and beg her forgiveness. greens indicate the forests. So as you see, half of the whole is wooded. Now where we find green cross with red, we have the range of elks, wild goats. We show both the flora and the fauna. <laughs> now on the lake, we have swans and geese, ducks, and as the old folks say, a power of birds. I mean, as they would say, as far as the eye could see, as far as a cloud of birds just flying. <laughs> Here's 25 years have passed. Already we see only one third of the areas to move. The goats are gone, the elk, we still see elk occasionally. But the blue and green are vanishing and so on as we go down to the third rendition where we have the district as it is today. There is no solid green, but just the occasional patch. The goats and the swans and the geese have disappeared. Grouse are gone, the game birds, we, we find no trace of the old settlements. But in short, here is a perfect picture of a gradual and relentless decay, which in 10 or 12 more years will be totally complete and the land will be dead. I mean, you say, fine, you say, you say deep cultural influences are at work and the old life must naturally give way to the new, and I would agree with you if in place of decimated forests we had industry, and railroads, and schools under construction, and mills, and if the populace were, were happier and in better health and better employment, what do we have here? We have the same swamps and the same mosquitoes, the same typhus and diphtheria and rickets and diseases of poverty, so that what we see is this, a struggle for existence that is beyond human strength. I see that this doesn't interest you. Well, I understand so little of it. Ah, apart from that, though, it holds no interest for you. I must tell you that my mind is on other things. Oh, I see. <laughs> what preoccupied me was... Forgive me. Will you sit down? American Sue. 
concerns my stepdaughter, Sonia. Yes? How do you feel about her? I respect her. And your feelings towards her as a woman? My feelings toward her as a woman? Yes. I have none. Okay. Now, how did you feel today? Sometimes I just get so... I want to do it all so much that, that I lose my grounding. It, it's, it's like it just all comes up at once. You know, you can't get... To... You know what's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. Because it's, it's true for many of us. You aren't functioning as an actress you're an actress you're a born actress you should be on stage all the time and you're not and then the pent up the the i'm gonna start crying it's devastating then we get a chance and then it isn't complete and it isn't really going the whole way it's agony that's why we have to make our own theaters Right? That's what's torturing you, nothing else but. And if once you know what it is, I mean, then it'll help a little bit. Okay. What can you tell me? Uh, I'm still having trouble with um, uh, sort of what I, what I told you before about the map. The map. I, no, uh, I didn't. I, I thought not at the very opening, a little middle section where you lost volition for it. Yeah. And then you gained it again, and that will vary too in performance. It's so frustrated because I I try to find something from my life that that has such meaning to me that I I need to. Somebody. Why were you crying just Her. now? <laughs> that's what. Well, that's that the, the meaning. That started, that's thought, the that's meaning. Put into this map. It, yeah. But exactly, and exactly. I, and I keep feeling like um, if I bring this feeling from something else into this, I keep wanting to go just with the given circumstances. But you see, when you find though, me, when you find the, your substitution, and then now you truly transfer it to the map, and these become synonymous. That takes a while. What I use for certain things, and there, this one I can talk about because it, it's long gone, but something that I used at a certain section, like the trigger moment in Virginia Woolf, I used something, and I don't know why it was me, why it triggered the whole experience in me, it was some kind of the, the ivy crawl, a piece of ivy crawling up a stucco wall and asking where I once lived. And that leaf, well, eventually, if I think of that leaf now, it comes from Virginia Woolf, not from Maasning anymore. It becomes synonymous. And when you're not accustomed to ma making transferences and always making sure they have a consequence in the action, that's what anchors them to you. You see, when, they're by, when they stay by themselves and don't get truly transferred, they're very iffy. Give me an example of the consequence in the action. Uh, what, what is the vine leaf, the emotion that is triggered by the vine leaf, what does that make you do about it? And the doing is to somebody or something on stage. And what is the nature of that action? And if, if it isn't, doesn't lead you to a defined action, it's ephemeral. It hangs there by itself like a little emotional object. So what? Do you see what I mean? And that isn't totally translated yet to that map. It just takes a while. It doesn't come fast when you're not used to doing it. And again, let me remind you, I worked on the cherry orchard for about 10 years. I worked on it in English first, then I did it in Russian, then I finally got to do it in a dreary production. The Closing performance, I found out how to say goodbye to the cherry orchard. The closing night, and I didn't have another chance to do it again, you know? So th that's the terrible thing with Chekhov. We can't be impatient in it. 
We can't score it like a storyline. This I'll play here, and I'll play that there, and I'll play that there. I have to have all the sources. That's why I say three quarters of Chekhov is homework. And then doing it and doing it and leaving it free and leaving it limber each time something else will happen. If something is inevitably correct, you'll probably stick to it. But if you stick to it for its effect, it'll be dead. Right? It's, it's, it's an in, in bottomless hunt for this. So you see, sometimes you are impatient with yourselves and you want it all to be there at once. It can't be. It's impossible. That I just thought you found out 20 new th Didn't the monologue work better? Now what about that? That in itself, you've learned a ton. But you see, the doing is what releases the, the, the inner life and releases the images and makes you need to talk. Otherwise, you stand and you don't even know. I mean, the years I stood with monologues and thought, how can I start talking? Not sneaking in. No, not starting that way, but starting. <laughs> you know? I just thought you, you made enormous progress. So you should be very excited. OK? Good. It's amazing what can happen. You can feel, geez, I can't get this guy. I haven't got him yet. What is it? And then when you get into the costume, something happens in the picture missing. And I got an idea, and I called up Costa Galvez, and uh, I said, Costa, can I wear a thin-brimmed sort of Brooks Brother hat just put on straight on my head all through this picture, whenever it's possible. Unless I sit down to dinner, I'd like to have that hat on. And he said, yeah, great, I can see it. What the hat did for me was be a lid. I, I was aware that I was wearing this hat most of the time, and it helped keep me contained. I don't know why, but it works for me. One of the most important things, by the way, in most plays, is um, underwear. Now, you know, when you say, uh, oh, those Victorians were so, so, such prim and proper people, you know, they always sat so straight. Well, they were wearing corsets. And it's very hard if you have stiff, stayed corsets coming up and holding you up to do this. You can't. So again, it's not a matter of playing style because that's how they were, but find what it came from. If they say, oh, you shouldn't cross your legs, I say, for the purpose of the exercise, do what they did. They wore two petticoats. I defy you to try to cross your legs. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> then you won't cross your legs. You will sit because of, not because it's stylistically correct. If your sleeve, instead of being a latex uh, uh, sleeve that bends very easily and it's very tight, and it's so you'll find that you can't bend your elbow. Do you see? You can only bend it so far. And that if you pour, if you have a beautiful, in an Oscar Wilde play or something, everybody's always, you know, playing style. Uh, if you have a long ruche hanging here that it took your housekeeper an half an hour to press properly, you won't want to dunk it in the tea. You will make sure that it's up. If, if it's good manners not to get a lot of fingerprints on the, on the silver teapot, you will pour in order not to get the fingerprints on. Then you will find the behavior. Uh, and of course, I, I know that nothing has changed in the human psyche except fashion and social morals. But we always got mad. We always fell in love. We always were possessive. We were always slightly neurotic. You know, all the things that we think are only us today have always been true for the human being. And uh, thought for this exercise to take a character. This is the first time you take a character that you may be going to work on or that you always wanted to work on and take him out, take him or her out of the crisis in which they find themselves in the given play and give them a simple task, that something they might do every day or that they, something I did yesterday or I'm going to do after the crisis is over. 
so that I start to discover all the sources that make it different than it is now. And to see if I can put my character into a time and place so that I believe I lived there then. That is really the purpose of that exercise.
was divine. Mar, we walked into another time and place. From the moment you walked in. I, I had some, thank you. I, I, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I, I mean, it was just so right on. It was just superb, truly. Now, but did you have any questions? Well, I, I just... Woo. I can tell you love the character. I do. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> and now, what is so successful, first of all? The trouble with some of the objects which are difficult is that we run out of inner objects under non-crisis circumstances to keep our attention going while we get dressed. Button buttons, lace shoes. Put a, see, that was your bustle. I mean, it was just... I, t I oh. put him on very tight today. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to... And then the, the tightness in relationship to the shoes. No, it was wonderful. The... Uh, uh, what you gain from this exercise and how to work on it, this was an example. You won't see it much better than that. And now if she played this character, three quarters of the work on the who am I and her faith in historic time and place has been conquered. It's just wonderful. And it never is a costume. You see, that's the, the dangerous thing. She's not putting on a costume. She's putting on her clothes. She's washing her face, not somebody else's. She is uh, uh, hanging up that particular blouse for tomorrow. I mean, everything. Just wonderful. Every single object you selected in terms of a different time and place and making that habit rather than something strange. Or they did, they would, they would light a, a, a lamp like that, they would light their candle. Like, it was you doing it as though it were your candle, your room, and your habit. It's just wonderful. Literally, not one criticism. Of course, each one of the exercises you can do 10 times or more, which is why people, when they study with me in the beginning, after two, two or four terms, they're still on the second or third exercise because I don't expect you to race through them. So by the time you get to this exercise, you've been a long time doing the others. When you, and, and once you've exhausted this, then there's a wonderful way of combining them. So you do Charlotte outdoors, right? Charlotte outdoors waiting for somebody. Charlotte having a picnic by herself outdoors. Uh, or an, a, any kind of character that gives you trouble in terms of faith. Um, it's just combining exes. You can see they all easily combine. Uh, Geraldine Page studied with me, God knows, uh, all, in all in all about six years, not consistently. And she would come back. And the last few times she came back in the, in the last few years, she only did object exercises. And I said, why? She said, when I did them, I didn't know how valuable they are. She said, it gives me a chance to work on all these, the staggered conditions, you know, how many, when we put one, we put being in a hurry while I'm hot with a headache and, you know, and I really staggered conditions. That's a very useful exercise. But, uh, no, this was... Superb. Okay, very good. Thank you. If I were younger, and, and, and you know the old thing, if you had it to do all over again, not the whole thing to do all over again, but at some point I would like to have studied the classics more and tried the classics more. I've only done Shakespeare a couple of times in some small parts. I didn't do them very well. And uh, I think it's because I felt a lack of freedom within them. I never felt in control. Good morrow, Kate. Well, that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard? It's something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine, but do talk of me. You lie in face where you were called plain Kate. And Bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the Cursed. <laughs> Kate. The prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall. My super dainty Kate. Or dainties are all Kates. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of, and the 
be of each town business. Yet not so deeply as to thee belongs. Myself am moved and willing for my life. Moved? In good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. <laughs> I knew you at the first, you were immovable. Why, what's immovable? A joint stool. <laughs> Thou hast hit it. Come sit on me. <laughs> Asses are made to bear, and so are you. <laughs> Women are made to bear, and so are you. Then such jade as you of me, I mean. Oh, that's good, Kate. Oh, for me, for knowing me to be but young and light. Too light for such a swine as you to catch. And yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be? Should buzz. <laughs> well, Tane, and like a buzzard. <laughs> That's slow and true. Shall a buzzard take me? Aye. For a turtle, as he takes a buzzard. Oh, come, come, you wasp and bait, you are too angry. If I be waspish, must beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, <laughs> <laughs> if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does where his sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tails, and so farewell. What? With my tongue in your tail? Come <laughs> again, good Kate. I'm a gentleman. That I'll try. I swear I will cover you and strike again. So may you lose your arms if you strike me. You are no gentleman. And no gentleman? I then no arms. A herald, Kate. <laughs> oh. Put me in thy books. What is your crest? A cock's comb. A combless cock, so it will be my hand. No cock of mine. You crow too like a crow. <laughs> A lot better. 
Oh, yeah. We heard you. You know now what the words mean. They don't always land, but uh, that we're going to talk about. That's the next step. But you really made big progress in the scene. Isn't it funny how then you suddenly understand the scene? It suddenly makes sense if you really talk to each other. Now, how did you feel? Um, in, in great part, very good. There were times when I, I feel like I'm being demonstrative in the scene. And I keep going in my head about not wanting to do that as an actor. Do you know what I mean? If you do it for her, right. it's correct. Right. If you do it for right. us, no, it's, it's right. bad acting. Right. Do you follow? Right. Now, the expectations. You aren't new enough to each other. You already know each other too well. When you send the action, what is the consequence? How did it land? That will lead you to the next. And sometimes you drop in between. When, once you've taken the scene apart and understand it this well, don't do homework about receiving it. Receive it and go. Do you follow? That it will be more tightly linked without rushing it. The selection of activities is like day and night now, isn't it? I just thought you learned so many things from this scene that I'm just thrilled. Oh, you should be too. And you see that we can talk like this, right? I have a Shakespeare class. What's interesting is that in the beginning, the idiom is so strange to us, and it's really almost like talking a foreign language. Uh, when you get used to it, uh, instead of saying, where are you going? If I uh, say often enough, whither are going, it's as, as real to me as the other, do you see? And then we come to the extraordinary things of the fabulous imagery and use of language and ideas that are behind it, which we have to make our own. Okay. No, it was very, very good. Excellent. Okay, I had a ball working with all of you, and I hope I'll come back. Thank you.